As we remain standing, the Reverend Jeffrey Crenshaw is going to come and read our scripture tonight. And then Bishop J.L. Carter will lead us to the throne of grace. scripture from the book of Romans chapter 12 verse 1 and verse 2 I beseech you therefore brethren by the mercies of God that you present your bodies a living sacrifice holy acceptable unto God which is your reasonable service and be not conformed to this world but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God this is the word of God for the people of God all our sins and griefs to bear. What a privilege it is to carry everything to God in prayer. Oh, what peace we often forfeit. Oh, what needless pain we bear. All because we do not carry everything to God in prayer. Father, we thank you again for all that you've done for us. We thank you for how you kept us last night and early this morning you allowed us to rise again, Lord. And God, when we got up, we realized that we were still in our right minds, Lord. We still had limbs that was working. A few had a few pains along the way, but we still thank you, dear Lord. God, we're here tonight because we still believe that your word is still living manna from on high, Lord. And God, and we thank you for what we've already experienced, Lord. Thank you for the teaching and the lecturing that has already gone forth. God, we thank you for Dr. Carter, who blessed us earlier in the session, Lord. And tonight, God, we believe that you have prepared the preacher, dear Lord. God, just have your way, Lord. Any way you bless us, dear Lord, we'll be satisfied. We thank you for the leadership, dear Lord, of this impact, the leadership of Dr. Johnny Green and Dr. Carl Washington Jr. and Dr. Patrick Young. We thank you for that, dear Lord. We understand with no leadership, Lord, we go nowhere, Father. Thank you for these who have pressed their way out, dear Lord. God, have your way, Lord. Have your way. Bless tonight, dear Lord, in a major way. God, we are still your children. And in this dangerous Donald generation Lewis Carson that we're accepted the call into the ministry at the age of 12. In 1991, Pastor Carson organized local Baptist Assembly where he of proudly the universe, Lord. And so, God, we thank you, dear Lord. Keep each of us and guide us and lead us. Bless our families, dear Lord. Bless us financially, dear Lord. Bless us with good health, Lord. God, we just thank you. Now bless the remaining of this worship experience. Oh God, we are expecting to be blessed in a great way. Have your way, Lord. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. To our president and host pastor, Dr. Johnny Melvin Green Jr. to amen, our lecturer and preacher for tonight in the person of Dr. Parsons and Dr. Clark to our general secretary, Dr. Young, and having sharing with us tonight, amen, um, um, two ladies I love a whole lot, amen, in the person of my wife, amen, Lady Bonita Washington, amen, and my cousin, Amen, Lady Jacqueline Green. Amen. Just so good to see them out with us tonight as we lift up the name of Jesus in this place. I don't believe we need to introduce them again. I think they will introduce themselves. And so what we're going to do is we're going to prepare for our lecture with our praise team. Amen. And um, thank God for all of you. And after our praise team shall have led us into this, amen, our lecturer will come, and then we'll come back to you. Amen. Is that all right? Sing something lectury. Well, 
I'm just gonna be honest and tell you, I don't really know what that means. <laughs> but I think it means we're gonna sing something together. Is that all right? Song says, Glory, glory, hallelujah. Since I lay my burden down, glory, glory, hallelujah. Since I lay my burden down, sing it again, glory, glory. Friends don't treat me like they used to since I laid my burdens down. Friends don't treat me, friends don't treat me like they used to since I laid my burdens down. My husband sings this one. We are climbing Jacob's ladder since I laid my burdens down. We are climbing Jacob's ladder since I laid my burdens down. Burdens down, Lord. Burdens down, Lord. Come on. Burdens down, Lord. A one for a run, starting on one. I laid them down. I lay, I laid them down. These are heavy burdens. Yes, I laid them down. These are heavy burdens. Yes, I laid them down. At the feet of Jesus. Yes, I laid them down. He has. Glory, glory, hallelujah, since I laid my burdens down. Glory, glory, hallelujah, since I laid my burdens down. Hallelujah. Lewis Parson accepted the call into the ministry at the age of 12. In 1991, Pastor Parson organized Logos Baptist Assembly, where he proudly continues to pastor the ever-growing congregation on Chicago's far south side. He has held membership and leadership positions with Rainbow Push. And so he is greatly to be praised. To all of the distinguished persons present, more specifically 
pastor and organizer, conceptualizer, Pastor Johnny Green. whose thoughts and hopes have brought us together. The second gathering, the chairman, the board, Washington, distinguished the president and officers of the Empire State President. To all of you, my brothers and sisters, who come to share uh, tonight my uh, cohort uh, in this adventure uh, within which uh, we've all better been reminded there's a, a sliver of a membrane between layers of our reality. And so there's a thin line between lecturing and preaching. Thank you for the lecture song. <laughs> Did God do anything for you today nobody could have done for you but God? If so, just shout hallelujah. Praise God. Man, I like that response. Let me ask you another question. You all were good with that one. Did God do anything for you today that no man could have done, even if they had tried? If so, just say, thank you, Jesus. Our God is amazing. And the truth is, he's a serial blesser. Uh, a repeat defender. Every time I need somebody to obstruct my enemies, he keeps getting in between me and them. Uh, he's a repeat defender. I love the Lord. He heard my cry. I uh, am excited to have the opportunity to share with you in this experience. I want to invite your attention tonight for just a few minutes to a passage of the scripture from the book called uh, Genesis. I'm excited about seeing my brother Bishop Carter. He promised me a few days ago he would show up. Good to see you, Bishop. Chapter 37 of Genesis, verse 5. And a couple of the verses that follow uh, say this in the New International Version of the Scripture. Joseph had a dream. And when he told it to his brothers, they hated him all the more. He said to them, listen to this dream I had. And then verse 9 says, then he had another dream. And he told it to his brothers, listen, he said, I had another dream. And verse 10 says, when he told his father as well as his brothers, his father rebuked him and said, what is this dream you had? Let's talk a few minutes just about what I'd like to call and what I've called uh, a lot of years ago, dreams. <clears throat> dreams. For some reason, I was of the opinion that I would be speaking with people tonight who still had some unexpired expectations. I thought maybe there would be a couple of folk in the room who are still incubating the hope that what is not will still become. I am believing that just maybe in the group there are some people who are not ready to surrender the cerebral for the reality of their present moment. In other words, they're not ready to give up 
for what they've been thinking because of how they're living. I think it's so important that we continue to nurture our expectation of what we have not yet experienced. And in a common sense, these are labeled dreams. Not to get into the psychodynamics why you dream, how you dream, what levels and layers you dream, whether it's REM sleep, <clears throat> rapid eye movement sleep, or what level of consciousness you're in when you begin to have these uh, visual projections in your subconscious. Uh, I've not really come to discuss that level uh, since... Uh, you already know I'm neither a psychiatrist nor a psychologist or a brain scientist, but I know a few things about dreams. I wanted to talk with you about your dreams. Have you ever wondered why you have them? Have you ever wondered why, if I have them, I have dreamed I am without the resources to achieve? <clears throat> if I have dreams, why do I have hopes, aspirations, ambitions, and expectations of becoming something I don't know anyone who is? What is it about dreams? Not the ones you get as a collective result of a bad digestive system and eating after 8 p.m. at night. <laughs> Not those. You might have a different name for them. A nightmare. I've not come to talk about those stimuli that stimulate subconscious thought once you entered into the land of slumber. But I wanted to talk to you about hopes, the rescue of your ambition. I wanted to talk to you about how can I preempt those who desire to co-opt my progress and my success. While I don't have the answers for any of these questions, I thought Joseph might. And so I've invited you to journey with me for a few minutes uh, back to the genesis of dreams and to meet a young guy who became a dreamer and whose dreams were of things and places not near where he resided, uh, whose expectations and aspirations were about becoming something he had never seen in a place he had never been. Are there any people in the room who have dreams about going where you haven't gone, doing what you haven't done, becoming what you have not become, I didn't mean to get that loud. I saw a lady doze and I was just trying to uh, wake up. I'll come back down. I'm sorry. Uh, have you ever had a, a dream? It's so important that we fully appreciate why even with dreams, they are sometimes assaulted by the callous jealousy and envy of others. And, and where do you meet your first dream haters? Uh, I wanted to talk about some of these things uh, for a few minutes, but it begins with verse 5, a young man suggesting that he has 
as a dream, something implanted in his subconscious that tells him uh, he is not what he will become. Uh, something in his sleep reveals to him that he will occupy a level, a layer, and a place in life uh, that he's never known anybody to occupy uh, in his own uh, experience as an individual, even at uh, 17 years old. Let me uh, take a moment just in case I should not assume uh, that you've already met Joe. <clears throat> uh, Joe is a, a young man who is the, the son of a father who fathered a son in his old age. Uh, something I have a little experience uh, with. He uh, decided to buy or to create, to make his younger son, let me explain the rest of his uh, situation. Did I tell you the quieter you are, the longer I take? <laughs> I forgot. Let me tell you his environmental uh, situation. One, he lived in the house with his daddy and some other babies, mamas, and, and their kids. <clears throat> yep. I know you might be player, player, but you can't do this. You got other babies' mamas. I'm sure they and their mama are under a different roof. <laughs> this brother Jacob had them all under one roof. It, it, it's critical that you understand the environmental influence was fertile and ripe uh, for sibling rivalry. Uh, it was rich ground for enmity and adversarial relationships, even between blood-connected, chromosomal-connected, uh, genetically connected people. Uh, here they are all living in the same house. What an amazing anomaly uh, in our culture. <laughs> uh, not in this one. However, Joseph had uh, evoked the ire of his brothers because the Bible says their perceptivity allowed them to sense that their dad loved their brother more than he loved any of them. Not to mention uh, all of the undercover nudging by the other babies' mamas that they need to get close to the old dude. Uh, because this, this youngster has come in to redirect his attention. Gave him this coat of many colors to suggest how excited he was that the reproductive factory had called their workers back to the assembly line. Because he had a baby in his old age. And, and so uh, they were pretty disturbed with uh, this whole circumstance. And then here, this, this shouted, this youngster, uh, this, this juvenile in their own uh, description and understanding telling them, hey, y'all, I had a dream. I got a dream, I got a dream. Have you ever wondered uh, what was the uh, opening cause for the contamination and the death of your dream? Well, it could be uh, rule number one, you need to know who to share it with. Yeah, most of us don't share our dreams with people who got fertilizer. We share our dreams with people who are ready to kill it. 
we share our dreams with people who say things like, who you think you are? Are you planning to be better than the rest of us, huh? I don't know nobody else who ever done that. Or what you say you dream? Or where you plan to get the money from? Well, y'all don't know people like this. I'm sorry, maybe it's the wrong state. Where I come from, your dreams can be easily canceled when you have conversations with people who intended to make your dream a casualty. Uh, come on, hang out with me just one moment. The word of God says, Joseph said to his brothers, I, I, ha I had a dream and I want to share it, share it with you. I raised this question a few minutes ago and asked you, do you remember where you met the first dream haters? They'll usually be under the same roof. Usually you meet your, your first haters in your own house. You might be sitting next to them and you don't want to say nothing right now. It's okay. Some of y'all got real quiet and started looking down when I said that. You'd be surprised where you can meet your greatest discouragement uh, by people who think they know you, who think they've already assessed your potentiality, people who think they got a good feel for your possibility, who you can become and what you can't become. His brother said to him, Joe, who do you plan to be? And then it wasn't enough for him to tell him once and be rebuffed by their commentary. Uh, he was uh, determined for them to join in and become co-signers of his hopes for himself. So he tells them again, uh, let me tell you, I had another dream. Let me assure you that when people are not ready to board your dream, uh, you need to fully appreciate who they are. Well, just let me throw this in for free since you gave me a little extra time. You know, I want to ask you to assess the people with whom you share your dreams. Uh, are they your comrades, your confidence, or your companions? Well, now, uh, you see, comrades are people who share a cause with you. And they're only with you because y'all for the same cause. Uh, so that, th those are your, your comrades. And do you share your dream with comrades, people who, who appear to be friendly toward you but disinterested in your, in your future? Comrades. Uh, you have camaraderie. Uh, you laugh and you talk, but you don't really have discussions about hopes and ambitions. They're just, your, you need to be able to assess your crew, uh, your posse, your dogs. Uh, I don't mean to be crass. That could be an acronym for disciples of God. But you, you got a crew. You need to know who you share your dreams with. Uh, are they just your companions? You see, sometimes you don't know. You watch people who live together. And when their kids reach 18 or 19 and out the house, then they separate. Because they were really comrades as opposed to lovers. They only had one destiny. To get the kids gone, then I'd be gone. And so, I'm back. Comrades. Are they just uh, companions? See, companions are people who are with you for where you're going. 
companions will ride with you until somebody comes by in a faster car. And then they'll change cars because you're not going where you were going fast enough, and this person is going to get them there faster. You've got to check whether you're with comrades or companions. I mean, who's your passenger? Or maybe it's a confidant. Or somebody who you can share you with and somebody who shares themselves with you. But you've got to understand with whom you share your dreams because the people you share your dreams with can cancel your expectations for yourself, even in your own house, even in your own family. People who share your own bloodline have your own genetic disposition. People who have this chromosomal connection and this relationship through the same womb and still end up being your haters. I don't mean they dislike you, they just want to succeed before you. He said to his brothers, I had a dream. Then he told his dad, and his dad rebuked him. So who do you think you are, boy? We're going to be bowing down to you. Let me tell you, maybe your dreams got lost because you shared them with the wrong person. But I've only come to tell you to hang on to them and understand that when God gives you an expectation, when he places something in your soul that makes you discontent until you arrive at your perceived destination, then you've got to fully appreciate that dreams have a life of their own. God has a way of planting in us a hunger to become but we cannot explain why that's my hunger but have you ever noticed he has a, an adequate distribution of dreamers so there are enough fire persons enough police people enough nurses enough doctors because everybody has been given a different dream what's yours God has given you one make sure you share it with people who are ready to nurture it people who were incubated, people who were fertilizing, people who would say, I can see it in you. You can do it. Don't give up. Don't surrender your expectations, your hopes, or your aspirations. Don't die on the table of Kent. Because success doesn't come in Kent, it comes in cans. I can. I will. I shall. His brothers, his dad were disturbed by his dreams. It's amazing that somebody would be disturbed by your dream. Hate you for what you think. But come on now, hang out with me a moment. You see, a dream is not your reality. Why are you getting jealous of a dream? Why are you hating on a dream? Why are you disturbed by a dream? Because what it says is they like you how you are and don't want you to become who you intend to be. They want you to hang out so you can make them comfortable. See, some people would not be comfortable with who you plan to become. To that rather you cancel your dreams than leave them lonely. They'd rather you say, I ain't going. I'll stay here with you. If you're trying to drag them along, let me tell you how hopeless it is to drag somebody up a ladder. Now holler back at a brother when you get to point. It's easy to pull them down, but you try dragging them up a ladder. And some of y'all in here spent your life trying to drag somebody up to your dream. They ain't going and they ain't coming and you can't take them. His daddy sent him out to check on his brothers who were doing a little herding of the sheep in one of their faraway locations. He goes out to see them, to check on them, and one of them spotted him with that bright coat. Let me give you another good clue. Don't go dressed up around people who work at heart.
Now you're about to evoke a whole lot of enmity and hateration on you. Uh, showing up all dressed up for, with people who working hard, looking like you don't even plan to do anything. They saw him coming with that bright coat. They said, uh oh, there come that dreamer. He already trying to dress like where he's going. So you ought to dress like who you want to become. You ought to start going in the store now where you plan to shop. Here he comes and his brothers look across the meadow and they see him coming. Here come that dreamer. And here's a brother who says, well, let's kill him. Oh. Let's kill him. What did he do? All he had was a, a dream. They wanted to kill him for his dream, his persistence with his dream, his determination that his dream was true, his belief that I'm going to be who I saw myself as. And I want to share with you tonight, many of you cannot see who you saw in your dream because you refuse to allow the, 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 the now you to pass away so the, the you that you saw can become because there are a whole lot of yous inside of you that ain't come out yet. Because they are too uncomfortable and you're too uncomfortable with them so you'd rather be who you are than become who God plans for you to be. And, and so your dream can't come true because you don't even believe in your dream. Obvious, this boy felt a little royal wearing this coat of many colors out to the field where his brothers were just watching the sheep. Wasn't even no young sisters out there to see him with that pretty coat on. Just his brothers. They said, let's kill him. Let's kill him. What enmity. What jealousy. Just based on his thoughts. People do kill dreamers for dreams on the balcony of the Lorraine Hotel. The dreamer was killed just for having an expectation that solutions would be available for all the people who have been victimized by antisocial behavior. You can get killed for your dreams if your dreams are powerful enough. But sometimes I'm just amazed that how many of us, just a side note since you're a little quiet, are surrounded by people in churches and other holy places with entourages and uh, barrels of armor and bodyguards and we don't even think powerful. We don't even say anything dangerous. I wonder who you protecting yourself from. Ain't nobody, like nobody trying to get you for what you said. You got 15 people with earpieces in their ear and you just preaching to, to Jesus. Just a side note. But our, our perceptions of who we are, if, if you're going to have some powerful dreams, then you ought to have some powerful statements. You ought to have some things that make people want to get at you. And you then you get you a a brigade or two to surround you, but you ain't saying nothing dangerous. You ain't even threatening the devil intensely. Subject one coming around the corner from the office. I'm sorry. They saw him coming. There comes that dreamer. I'm here to tell you, you never know how your dream will be funded nor capitalized. Don't, don't, don't despair because you don't have the resources. Joseph was in Horeb and had a dream about Egypt and didn't know how he would get there. But he was headed toward his venture capitalist. 
He was headed toward his funding source and didn't know it. His brother said, let's kill him. They threw him down in a cistern, a dried up well. Threw him down there and had lunch right outside the well while he down there saying, all right, y'all stop playing. They were eating cheese and kosher sausage. <laughs> Having a little wine. And then they saw a caravan coming. Say, uh oh! One brother said, We don't have to kill him. There's our way out. Let's sell him. See, they, they, they were convinced, one, that uh, this coat was a symbol of his favor. They were disturbed because this coat reflected uh, extensive uh, e enamel flavor, a favor with his brother from their dad. They didn't like it. And so they, they took this coat because the coat represented his favor. But I'm here to tell you, can't nobody take your favor. No, you can't wear favor. They took his coat and put blood on it. So we're going to take it back to dad and tell him, he got killed coming to check on us. They took his coat, saw a caravan, decided to sell him. Look at Joseph, put in a system. No one to call, no dad to reach out to, because in, in the well, there was nobody around him, nobody in front of him, nobody behind him, nobody beside him. There was only one way to look. And sometimes when you get to the point of your dream where you're ready to get rid of desperate, know this. Uh, that God will put you in a place where you only have one direction to look. Father, I stretch my hand to thee. No other help. I know if thou would withdraw thyself from me, where shall I go? He puts you where there's nowhere to look but up. Why did my friends desert me? Why are my family standing to the side waiting on me to pull this all by myself? How am I supposed to make this happen? Don't worry. If God gave you the dream, he also provided the funding. They killed him. They gave him, sold him out to a caravan. Took his favor. Took his coat. Thought they had his favor. But that ain't really what happened. I tell you, it was a strange occurrence that when he got down, he got down in Egypt. Uh-huh. What I want to tell you, my brothers and my sisters, is that uh, when Joe got down, in Egypt. Favor had already made it to town. Uh -huh. Well, let me close by saying to you tonight, uh -huh. when he got down to Egypt, Joseph was hired out to a master in Egypt. Favor was already there, waiting on him to get to town. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. He became the master of the whole household. You remember, you remember the story of how his master's wife, yeah, Lord, she lured him into a boudoir and called in Joseph. She tried to get him in the bed with her. Joseph keeps on having a, a garment problem. Uh -huh. He lost his coat of many colors to his brother. 
And now he's had to lose, uh, lose his garment uh, to his boss lady. Do you hear me? And when her husband, uh, when he came, when he came home, she told her husband, uh, yo, yo, favorite employee, he tried to assault me. Did you hear me? And he came to Joseph uh, and said, I'm so disappointed. Uh, and you know what's going to happen. Uh, you going to prison. Uh, uh, it seemed like uh, Joseph's dream uh, has come to an end. Uh, and, uh, but look at Joe. When he got to prison, I was just thinking uh, favor had finally run out on him. But I got to tell you, uh, when it left his master's house, it ran down to the prison. Uh -huh. When he got in jail, favor gave him the keys and said, wait a minute, uh, here you go. Can you imagine uh, going to jail and they're putting you in and then give you the keys to the jail? Ain't that favor? Ain't that favor? It might not be fair, but it shows you God. Ain't that how he works? That's how he works. Joseph in jail, running things, runs into a baker and a butler. And you need one of those if your dreams are going to come true. They had dreams. The butler had one and the baker had one. Let me throw this in. If you want your dreams to come true, you got to help somebody else with their dreams first. Did you hear me? You see, Joseph interpreted the dreams of the butler and the baker. And you need a butler and a baker on your team. Why you say that, Reverend? Well, butlers uh, open doors. If you want your dreams to come true, uh, you need somebody who can open uh, some doors for you. Why do I need a baker, Reverend? Uh, well, this is what bakers do. Uh, reach over here and get some eggs. Reach over here uh, and get a little milk. Reach back here and get some flour. Reach over here uh, and get a little sugar. What you trying to say, they pull it uh, all together. If you want your dream to come true, uh, you need somebody who can pull it all together. They got out of jail uh, and left Joseph in jail. Uh, and then the Pharaoh had a dream that he could not understand. And they said to him, we remember a man in jail uh, who told us our dream. If you call him, uh, he'll tell you what your dream is. Joseph got out of jail, ended up in the second chariot. What you trying to say, hang on to your dreams. They will come true. Oh, yes! Yes! Come on, everybody. Come on, turn the monitors up. I will trust in the Lord. I in the Lord I in the Lord till I die Until I die, oh, Father, I stretch my hand 
Come on, church. No Come on. I will trust in the Lord. I will trust in the Lord. I will trust in the Lord until I die. your glad hands together all over the building the officers are coming now I want you to come real quickly and set the table to receive the offering today I am so excited uh, tonight I'm excited about this conference I'm excited about what God is doing through the ministry of impact thank God for the leadership of impact the visionary leadership uh, of this organization and we thank God for those of us uh, who are helpful to our cause. Amen. And we thank you, 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 and you uh, who are here tonight. Happy to see Brother Lundell Davis in the house. Y'all give him a hand. He hosted our pre-conference breakfast at Lundell's restaurant. Thank you so much uh, for coming today. I want everyone real quickly to rest on your feet if you'll do that quickly if you do that I'm going to ask you to prayerfully consider giving tonight $20 prayerfully consider if you don't have it don't worry about it do your very best do whatever you can we're just trying to help to underwrite the expenses of a conference of this caliber can you say amen it takes money to do ministry, and we wouldn't dare. I want you to hear me, Harlem. I want you to hear me, New York City. We wouldn't dare bring preachers of this caliber all the way from out of state, all the way from across the Hudson, and not treat them right. We are being exposed this week to some of the greatest teaching and preaching and training in the word of God. Amen. And I'm, a, I'm so thankful that God has navigated the circumstances that has brought all of us to this place tonight. Amen. Eyes have not seen, neither have ears heard, nor has it entered into the hearts of men the great things that God has in store for us. And so I want you to, I'm not begging, I'm asking. Y'all know Pastor Green is not a beggar, but I will ask you. And so I'm asking those of you who have a heart for giving tonight, amen. I'm going to start the offering off with $100. And if you will give 20, amen. Pastors, if you'll help us tonight, we are trying to keep this conference free. Say amen. If you're making checks out, make your check out to Impact, M-P-A-C. Amen. If you're writing checks, don't write it to Mount Nebo, write it to M-P-A-C. If you want to give online, you can go to Givelify.com, Mount Nebo Baptist Church, and there is a line for the Impact Conference. Will you help us tonight? Will you help us? Look at somebody and ask, will you help tonight? Amen. Help us. We, we, we just want to be a blessing. We want to be a 
blessing to our guests who have come to bless us. Scripture says, if we have sown unto you our spiritual things, it is right for us to reap your carnal things. So please help us tonight. Bow your heads real quickly with me. Father, we are eternally grateful for everything that you have done, all that you are doing, and all that you will do in and through the power of the Holy Spirit during this conference setting. Thank you for these series of services against the kingdom of darkness. As you prepare us, as you work on us, as you overhaul us, as you energize us, as you pour your word into us through these earthen vessels, we pray that you would give us a generous spirit and a liberal pocketbook. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. Under the direction of the, thank you, here's Dr. Washington's 100. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Dr. Draper. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any other pastors? Thank you, Pastor Young. Thank you, Dr. Clark. Thank you, Dr. Elgin Taylor. Thank you so much. Again, we're happy to have Dr. J.L. Carter, Bishop J.L. Carter, from the Art Church, Baltimore, Maryland, in the house. One of my friends for more than 35 years. When my mother died, right after my mother died, he invited me to preach for him. I never will forget it. Thank God. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Sister Washington. Thank you. If you're online, amen. We're happy to have Pastor Derek Winkley of the Holy Tabernacle Church watching us online down in Dallas, Texas. We're happy to have Pastor Carlos Williams of the Pilgrim Rest Missionary Baptist Church in Dallas watching us. Dr. Roy Brackens, thank you. Thank you, Linda. Grace Tabernacle in Fort Worth, Texas. Thank you, Pastor Edward Davis, Chicago, Illinois, St. John. Baptist Church, Pastor Steve Thurston, New Covenant, thank you all for joining us online tonight. Many, many other pastors, Pastor Lance Mann, thank you. Thank you so much, Pastor Joe Carter, thank you. already been blessed. Dr. Carl Washington is going to come back and present uh, our preacher. Y'all give our preachers a hand. Give our... Listen, listen. If you preachers, ministers, if you miss the 5 p.m. lecture this evening by Dr. Jerry Carter, I want you to know you robbed yourself. You, you cheated yourself out of a blessing amen because he took us there and the reason why we come to these kinds of conferences is because we want to go there amen you remember the staple saying is i'll take you there he took us there today praise god we're gonna forego the introduction again amen and move into sermonic preparation Amen with our music ministry as they come. Let's be prayerful as God continues to strengthen us all through this feeding. Amen that we are receiving this week. This, this is a Waldorf Astoria meeting. From beginning to end. Dr. Carter, watch this. The issue with the conference right now is, y'all, we are not getting any real appetizers. 
we getting full courses in everything that we're doing. And so that, that's a good thing as we come in sermonic preparation. Here's another meal from the Waldorf. say thanks for all the things you have done for me things so undeserved yet you gave to prove your love for me the voices of a million angels cannot express my gratitude. All I am and ever hope to be. I I owe it all to thee, to God be the glory, to God be
to God be the glory for the things God has done. We're grateful. We're grateful on tonight to come before you to uh, share with you what you already know that God is good and, uh, and always worthy to be to be praised. Thank God for the uh, songsters for this week. Uh, uh, Pastor Green and Washington and Young, Pastor Carter, to our president with tonight, the pastors who are here, the people of God uh, that uh, make up this impact conference. Uh, it is really good to be here. Thank you again, Pastor Johnny Green, uh, for inviting me that I might share my convictions about our about our Christ to Dr. Donald Parson, our, our lecturer. And uh, you know, I've I've been a Baptist all my life, and I'm convinced I was young and. Now I'm older, and we still don't quite know the difference between a lecture and uh, you see, you see the thing, the thing that happened to me. I I messed around and went to to uh, got me some learning, and when they asked them the lecture. They uh, do about a three or four minute presentation, never lift their voice, and they sit down. In our tradition, once you once you start talking about dream dreamers, and there's personal commentary that's not shared about how some dreams are almost deferred. And you get caught up in it, your your voice starts to change, <laughs> and there's nobody more equipped at voice changing than Donald Parson. Yes, sir. Uh, uh, church, he has been one of the best preachers, best proclaimer down through the years. And I'm happy to share this space with him this week. Um, they're humble. Uh, and that as a young preacher, when you're trying to find your voice, I heard his and thought that I could sound like him. I could, that I could be him. Yeah, I think that's right. I think we all... Uh, were lured into that, thinking that we could be Donald Parson. And I'm watching him tonight uh, dance in this pulpit with his poetry and paint the picture uh, of Joseph with this uh, robe of many colors. caused him attention unwanted by the brothers yeah. that's what happens when you hear good stuff you get up ah. wanting to repeat some of that yeah. <laughs> I think I, I think that's I think that's the point of preaching that that we become after we hear it we become evangelists that we go and share what we've heard uh, and uh, thank you so much Pastor Parson for, for being who you have been down through the years so um, Acts 9 uh, certainly solicited 
prayers for night. Acts 9, verse 31. Then the church throughout Judea, Galilee, and Samaria enjoyed a time of peace and was strengthened, living in the fear of the Lord and encouraged by the Holy Spirit. It increased in numbers. This is the word of God. I believe it's true. The grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our God shall stand forever. Just that one verse. So tonight I, I want to lift as a theme to God our preaching. Um, ready, set, reset. Ready, set, reset. It was the men's 100 meter dash that I was watching when that was a false start. I don't know what caused it, but I do know that the runners had to get back in place to start again. They had to reset. For the more than average sport fans, they know very well that when opposing team has momentum and the game at the time appears to be getting away, the coach of the other team seems to be under siege, will call a timeout for the purpose of resetting. The timeouts are called hoping to stop a current flow of activity and to cast vision for new direction. Also, resets are not just for sporting events, but are part of our lived experiences. Knowing our lives are not lived in a straight line. There are times when we have to stop and pull over and assess the drama of our personal journey. And discovering that the only way to move forward is to is to reset. In this section of Acts, the church is at the intersection of self-centered isolation and new cultural formation. This is a significant intermission. This is a pause. This is a reset. This is not a reset. Recess is a reset that the church has been moving howbeit slowly toward the fulfillment of its command and mission. The practical framing of the context of verse 31 is a moment really to exhale. It happens that Stephen stoned to death and the church experienced persecution causing it to scatter. You know, persecution may not be pleasant when it's being experienced personally, but it sure can mature you better than popularity. It is persecution that caused the church to scatter throughout Judea and Samaria. And those who had been scattered preached the gospel wherever they went. However, Saul continued to breathe threats against the church when he went to the high priest asking for letters to the synagogue in Damascus that if he found anyone who were followers of the way, he could arrest them and take them into as his prisoners in Jerusalem. And one day while Saul was nearing Damascus, he had a Christophany that led to his dramatic conversion that the persecutor would become a preacher spreading the message that was attempting to silence him. As amazing as his personal encounter was, 
not everyone was convinced of his transformation and they remained skeptical. When he was sent to Tarshish, there was a great relief for the church. Their antagonist was no longer in their space breathing threats against them. As a result, the church throughout all Judea, Galilee, and Samaria had peace and was built up and walked in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Spirit and multiplied. However, even though the church embraced this moment to exhale, they were totally aware that the next wave of rejection and persecution was near that this was not a permanent place. For them, this was not a time for complacency, but rather an opportunity to be strengthened for the journey ahead that would make the church more inclusive and hospitable. That the church for this moment walked in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Spirit. There are several things here I want to lift and then I'll be out of your way and I pray I pray that it will bless you like it has blessed me that first the church in this moment is given an opportunity to regain its footing focus and faith that external circumstances has caused some insecurities and conflicts within their being stable in their religious conviction. That they were put in a position to ask really some fundamental questions about their identity, such as who are we and where are we going? You know, every crisis really calls us to ask some very fundamental questions about direction that a crisis does not always have to be a bad thing. But here in the text, I believe that the crisis pulled them back to square one. That square one is the foundation of personal understanding. That square one is the place of beginning. However, this is not all bad, as I have said. It has a twofold meaning that it can cause you to analyze where you are and it can cause you to carve forth an opportunity or to see the crisis as an opportunity to go into uncharted territory. Uh, that this is both a blessing and a burden that confronts the church. That this is the moment, brothers and sisters, that the church has walked in Initially, the fear of Saul. They also uh, were fearful because Stephen was stoned. They had been looking over their shoulder because brothers and sisters had been persecuted. Uh, but now, they walk in the fear of the Lord and, uh, and uh, in the power of the Holy Spirit. It's interesting that this fear uh, is not associated with the unpleasant emotion of change. That this fear has really nothing to do with the danger that they had experienced before. Uh, this is a reverent kind of fear. This is a, a worshipful kind of fear. This is the fear, Dr. Parson, that the brothers of Joseph had of Joseph thinking that Joseph, after daddy died, was going to retaliate against them. And if the brothers could fear Joseph like that because they knew that he stood under the umbrella of the grace of God, then how much more should we uh, take up the mantle of the brothers who feared Joseph uh, knowing that the right place for us is to walk in the fear of the Lord. And to walk in the fear of the Lord is in quiet confidence and self-assurance. 
knowing that their only fear ought be of the Lord. That's having the ability to be self-assured without the need for constant self-promotion because everything that is done is done unto the Lord. And they walked in the fear of the Lord, uh, not of the enemy that was around them, but in the fear of the Lord. This time, this time, that the church had not always walked in the fear of the Lord, but this particular occasion, that the Lord has given them a moment to reset and to establish their priorities again. And in the reestablishing of priorities, the church then walks in the fear yes. of the Lord and not the fear of the world. Uh, that in the fear of the Lord they walk, and in the comfort of the Holy Spirit, or in the power of the Holy Spirit. That the church as a community of the of justified sinners filled with the power of the Holy Spirit proclaimed Christ as the reason for their existence. Uh, it's interesting that this unstoppable message that started on the day of Pentecost when the Spirit was poured out confirming that new converts would come. In fact, 3,000 came on that day because of this message that they preached. And this is the same message that, that we preach if we would preach it. That if we, that if we would trust it enough to preach it, that, that uh, when Peter did, 3,000 souls accepted Jesus and were baptized. And then the Lord added daily to their fellowship based upon their ability to proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ. And they had all things in common. And there was a sense of equity in operation that uh, every believer uh, uh, was a part of. Bless his high name. And they met daily and prayed and broke bread and they walked in the comfort of the Holy Spirit. Bless his high name. That in the Gospel of John, you might recall, John has this, um, what you call this farewell address, this farewell discourse, where Jesus talks to the disciples about the power of the Holy Spirit somewhere around John 14 for Bible uh, readers tonight and Jesus tries to impart with them that I can't stay with you but I'm not going to leave you without I like that I, I like that myself that's, the, that's who we serve we, we, we serve a God that's not going to leave us without and hallelujah and so Jesus refers to the Holy Spirit as the paraclete. Yeah, yeah the paraclete. Paraclete as an advocate. Uh, the paraclete as a counselor. Uh, that an advocate is a supporter. An advocate uh, ensures that persons who are not normally heard are taken seriously and respect it. Yeah, uh, an advocate, uh, 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 a counselor, who says, yeah, that a counselor is a person that helps clients work through the wide range of social and emotional issues, such as uh, depression and anxiety, uh, stress and loss. Uh, relational challenges the counselor uh, helps us do that and so the Holy Spirit is seen as a counselor an advocate and a counselor that there is another uh, identifiable mark of the Holy Spirit uh, as a comforter uh, an advocate a counselor and a comforter 
a comforter. Uh, uh, you know, I learned this after, well, soon after I got married, I learned uh, what a comforter was. And uh, growing up in our house, there was no such thing. You, uh, you put on the, the cover up what you could find. But after I got married, I got introduced to a comforter. Uh, uh, and now a comforter is a popular bed covering, uh, uh, thick and fluffy, uh, like a blanket. And it's, and it's used to keep you warm. Uh, you know, some people's temperature fluctuates. One time they're cold, the other time they are warm. But the comforter comes and can make certain adjustments that you can put on. And, and, so, and so the Holy Spirit then is a comforter. Bless his high name, he's a comforter. You know, I always did enjoy Charlie Brown uh, Peanuts. And, uh, and, and in the Charlie Brown series, there was Lucy, Linus, and, and Charlie Brown. And these were the main actors. And, and if you remember, I know you do, Linus carried this thick blanket around with him everywhere he went. And, and, and Lucy used to get mad about Linus carrying this blanket. In fact, in fact Lucy hated the blanket that Linus carried. And, and, and one day they got the blanket from Linus and they buried it somewhere. And Linus, Linus went, went crazy. Be, 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 because the blanket for Linus was his reassurance. It was his comforter. Yeah, it was his security. Yeah, it was his American Express card that he didn't want to leave home without it. Yeah. And in like manner, uh, uh, the comforter is with us. The Holy Spirit is with us. He's our source of strength. Uh, he's our revelation about Jesus Christ. Uh, he guides us and he keeps us. He strengthens us. We are claimed by the comforter. We're in our right mind tonight because of the comforter. Do you realize how difficult it is to live in this world that at any point we could, could have lost our mind? But here we are tonight in our right mind. I used to hear the saints talk about being in your right mind, you know, that the Lord woke us up this morning clothed and in our right mind. I've lived long enough now to understand that that ain't jargon, that uh, we live through some tough times, through storm and rain, and you can very well lose your mind, but thanks be to God tonight, that when he woke us up this morning, he did so and we're in our right mind. Somebody ought to holler at me in here. What a mighty God we serve. The comforter who walks with us and talks with us. Let me move on here. Jesus said you receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you. Jesus said, ironic, when I was upstairs, there was a can empty, a can of Red Bull. Don't know who drunk it, but I can tell you what it's supposed to do. That the Red Bull is, is supposed to energize you. It, it's supposed to pick you up. Yeah, the, the Red Bull, when you've got a heavy assignment, is supposed to give you what you need to finish the assignment. And I'm here to testify tonight that the Holy Ghost, the comforter, is more than Red Bull. That once he gets in you, something starts to happen. Hallelujah. Listen, have you ever, and I don't want to assume that there are those who are worshipers in the house. And every now and then you might shout. And I, I tell you my policy on shouting, I don't let a month go by four Sundays without one of them Sundays being mine. 
that I wake up and I, I get dressed with the intentions of going to church knowing that I'm going to shout. Yeah, it's premeditated. Yeah, I promise you I do. As a child of God and when I look back over my life and I see how good God has been, it ain't hard for me to get my shout on. Listen, we haven't turned to our neighbor all week. We've been sitting here nice and trying to lecture and trying to preach like we got some sense. But if you know God been good to you, can I get you just to turn slightly to your neighbor and just tell your neighbor, I can't tell you at all, but I can tell you one thing, that the Lord show enough Hey, 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 that the Lord so been good to me. Uh, hallelujah. 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 Let the redeemed of the Lord He said, you shall receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And then after you receive it, you can't hide it. No, you can't hide it. I don't care how many people you make mad. After you get it, hallelujah, you're going to show some signs that the Lord will let you go through some stuff. And then he'll give you time to reset so you can sit and think about who brought you out? Who brought you through? Who brought you over it? Who brought you around it? It ain't been nobody but Jesus. So this week here, this impact week, and then I got to move on, dog. But this, this week here is about reset, that God has blessed us where we can put some stuff on pause so we can check the gauges of our life and see where we running low. Now I was getting ready to say something about shouting. I would, I would, and it almost got away me. Thank you, Lord. That, uh, you know, every place I go, I can identify the worshipers. I can identify them. Every place I go, I can identify the people who just there and then the worshipers. Because the worshipers have a I don't care attitude. You can spot them anywhere. They, they over you looking at them, laughing at them. They have come to the point, if God blesses me to get to his house, yeah, I'm going to praise him. Hey, excuse me, that thing happened, that thing happened to me. That, uh, you know, in some settings, you got to ask permission. But when you're filled with the Holy Ghost, yeah, yeah, the only person you pleasing is the Lord God Almighty. I, I, gotta, I gotta move on. I gotta move on. But help me one more time. Just tell everybody in your immediate context, you don't know like I know. How good? Hey.
just want to remind us that uh, as, as Jesus goes, so goes the church. Yeah, yeah. And so the, that, that Jesus ought to be the center of everything we do in the life of church. We ought not get tired of calling his name. Yeah, that, that our, our, our social justice is affirmed when we call the name of Jesus. I still believe that demons tremble at the name of Jesus. Yeah, have you ever had to call on him? And when you called him, didn't he answer? some enemies of the church uh, that Christian nationalists have some of the thoughts about the message of Jesus Christ and as they construct their own message about Christendom uh, in the absence of moral authority yeah, nationalists want the government to sponsor that movement and Christianity becomes the prop that they want to use to promote segregation, intimidation, isolation, and instigation. Uh, and they believe that America is defined by white nationalist Christianity. And the government should work to hold up what they believe. So when books are banned and critical race theory becomes a part of the political policies of fear, yeah, and immigration is poisoned and politicized and racial inequality and social progress, social programs are limited and the dismantling of democracy is the flavor of the day and authoritarianism is being pushed as the rule of law. This is what you call Christian natural. But God has a people that when you get past all of this, you better hear what I'm saying. I, I'm, listen, I don't even make no apologies that I believe what I preach and that I believe what the word of God says. Sometimes I gotta take that literally because that's all I got in this mean world. And we don't show up really, some of us, to be entertained. We wanna know is that word from the Lord we looked at the dangerous situations around us. We understand that our children and grandchildren have to try to tunnel through all of this. And I heard Jesus say, if I, if I be lifted up from the earth, that I'll draw. Oh, oh. Yeah, I'm just playing. I'm just teasing. Uh, uh, mm, yeah. They walked in the fear of God and in the power of the Holy Ghost. The text says, and they and they multiplied. They were edified and they multiplied. Yeah, that the church had. Uh, discovered the gift of hospitality. I'm cutting across the field, but the church had discovered the gift of hospitality. You know, in a contemporary sense with all of the ministries that we have in the life of our church, the most important ministry is that of hospitality. And because if people are not treated right and greeters are mean, and ushers say sit wherever you want. I don't care how great the preaching is that the people not going to stay in a house with mean people. Uh, and and, and hos hospitality is about giving care. Yeah, that we come in here wounded and weary and without. And uh, nobody really comes to church to have the membership to treat them worse than what they had to go through to get here. That's why hospitality is important. And, 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 and the church grew 
doing the reset because the disciples in the church, yeah, those who had heard the word, found out what was most important. I got to leave you. I got to leave you. You already got the message. Yeah, but, but, but in, the, in the life of the church and the face of the leadership, we need to know that it will change. In the context of the text, uh, Peter will decrease and Paul will increase. Yeah, that, that, will, that will be uh, the tradition of those who had been there. And then there are those who come in by way of Christian experience. See, Paul, Paul came to Jesus by way of Christian experience. And he ain't sinned, but God spotted him and knocked him down and put some sense into him. And, and, and then Paul dominates the New Testament. Uh, 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 but the church will have to do something again. They'll have to reset because there'll always be trouble. There'll always be trial. There'll always be conflict in the church. Can I just tell you this? You're not going to be able to stay in the church if you ain't filled with the Spirit of God. You, you, want, you want to know what keeps you in the church? It's being filled with the Spirit of God. I don't even know who I'm talking to. But every now and then, all of us feel like throwing in the towel. We feel like that on Monday. Yeah, we might feel like that on Wednesday. We might even still feel like that on Friday. But on Saturday, we start getting our church clothes ready because something down... Something down within us. Yeah, tell you got to get to the house. There's going to be joy in the house. There's going to be peace in the house. There's going to be understanding in the house. Hallelujah. Well, let me go on to my seat. I was looking at this. I was looking at this. And uh, I want you to know that resets are in order. Because... Because even God took one. God, 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 God had to reset. You see, in, in chapter one of Genesis, he says, and it's all good. In chapter two, a flaw came up. He created this garden, put the human family in the garden, gave them everything that they would ever want or need. And then he tacked on a prohibition. He put some trees there and he simply said, don't bother it. But, but then the serpent came. And I don't even know if this is an introduction to evil. I don't even want to talk about that. Because all the serpent does is start a conversation. He starts a conversation with the same people that have been talking to God every day. Been talking to God every day, and, and they permitted the serpent to enter into conversation with them. And it's labeled theology. Because the person who starts to talk, God talk, which is theology, is the serpent. And so don't be impressed with people who do theology. Because theology ain't talking to God. Theology is talking about God. Prayer is talking to God. And so the first couple and the serpent have a conversation about God. And the serpent was able to convince them that what God said ain't what he really meant. And when they were disobedient when they went against the program of God when they, when they grasped beyond their reach when they couldn't trust God because of the conversation the theological conversation that they had with the serpent God had to reset he didn't throw it away he just reset listen ain't you glad that when God starts to calculate what we are and what we are not, 
He never throws us away, but in his reset, we are redeemed. And if you're glad you've been redeemed, you ought to open your mouth and just tell the Lord, I'm glad that you redeemed me. Yeah, God said it right. It was a tree in the garden, and I don't know what was on that tree. Yeah, but there's another tree that he, he said in my reset, if I, if I place the tree in the garden and upset everything, I'm going to reset with a tree. This time, I'm going to put something more that can live up to my expectations on the tree. He placed his son there. Because every place where we had failed, his son had passed. And he died on that tree. Right about now, I wish I had Donald Parsons' voice. Because I'd be hooking that thing up. I'd be, well, all right. Uh, I can't do it like him, but I can do it like me. He died on the tree. Didn't he die? And they put him in. Yeah, after they took him down, they put him in a borrowed tomb. But early, 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 the third day morning, he got up with all power in his hands. Do you know him? Have you tried him? Ain't he all right? Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. If you're being redeemed, you need to say so. Shout yeah. 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 I'm trying to lead this alone, but when I think of the goodness of Jesus, how he woke us up this morning, how he started us on our way, my soul said, yeah, 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 yeah. Come on, everybody. Come on, come on, put your hands together. I'll say yes, Lord, yes, to your will and to your way. I'll say yes, Lord, yes, I will trust you when the spirit with my whole heart I'll agree and my answer will be yes come on everybody help me help me help me I'll say yes Lord yes to your will and I'll say yes I will when the spirit with my whole heart I'll agree and my answer yeah come on everybody oh I'll say yes Lord yes to your will and I'll say yes I will trust you when the spirit with my 
hope and my answer come on this is the last time let's raise the roof come on everybody oh I'll say yes Lord yes to your will I'll say yes I will trust you Oh, with the Spirit, with my whole heart, and my answer will be yes. Every head bowed, every eye closed, the musicians continue to play that. If you're here tonight, under the sound of my voice, every eye closed, every head bowed. We have heard this powerful, penetrating, and persuasive message coming from this preacher. And he has left no stone unturned. We have received a double portion through both messages tonight. And those of us who are saved, we're going to go down from this place tonight having been made the better because of the rhema word that has been deposited into our spirits tonight. But perchance someone amongst us tonight in this room under the sound of my voice, if you don't know Jesus in the departing of your sins, I want you to know that you can come under the ark of safety tonight. I want you to know that you can be saved tonight. I want you to know that if you accept Jesus Christ as Jesus Christos Kyrios, the Lord will change your life and make a difference. You can leave different than how you showed up. You can leave singing, what a wonderful change has been wrought in my life since Jesus came into my heart. If you're that person tonight and the Spirit is speaking explicitly and expressly to you tonight to make that leap of faith and to accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. How do I get saved? Preacher, I'm glad you asked. Paul said, if we confess with our mouths and believe in our hearts that God has raised Christ from the dead, we shall be saved. For with the heart, man believeth unto righteousness. With the mouth, confession is made unto salvation. You can be saved tonight by simply saying, Lord, come in. If you're here tonight and you have backslidden, if you're here tonight, you have faded away from the fellowship I want you to know you can be reclaimed tonight. You can come home. If this church is your church choice or if one of the impact churches is a choice of yours, we'll help direct you in the right direction. But don't let either of these messages go to waste tonight. Take this opportunity to receive Christ as your Savior. He not only wants to be in your life, but he wants to be on the throne of your life. Come on, everybody. Oh, I'll say yes to your will. I'll say yes. I will trust you when the Spirit, with my whole heart, I'll agree. And my answer will be yes, Lord, yes. Come on, put your hands together. It is 9 o'clock, and we're getting ready to make our exit. I want you to help us to close out on a high note. I want you to help us to close out in grand fashion. I want you to invite someone in your family, someone on your job, someone in your fellowship at the church 
where you attend. Tell them we have one more night. I want you to challenge your church leaders who are not here to be here for the congregational classes. We have been tremendously blessed in the Lord Auditorium by the grand teaching of Minister Cara Washington on last night, Pastor Carson Washington tonight, and on tomorrow night, Pastor Carl Washington III, Dr. Carl Washington III, is going to be leading and facilitating in the congregational class. I want preachers, I want preachers, I want you to help us to get the pastors out on tomorrow night. Pastors have been coming each night. We've had guest preachers from uh, across state lines, out of town. But we want you to help us. Tell your pastor friend, don't let this limited time opportunity pass you by. This is a limited opportunity. It's not every day you can get Jerry Carter, Donald L. Parson, and Freddie James Clark on the same platform. Amen. Don't let people rob you and tell you you ought not be there. You should be here, and they should too. This is a limited opportunity, and we want you to come. Pastor Carl Washington and Pastor Patrick Young, our general secretary, they've been working around the clock to bring this conference to you. Take advantage of it. Amen. Thank you, Dr. Parson. Thank you so much. This has been my preaching mentor since I was 18 years old. Everywhere he showed up to preach in the Dallas-Fort Worth Metroplex, I was there. Amen. And uh, when I grew up, thank God, he invited me to Chicago. And I, was, I thought I was on top of the world. Amen. Because we have greatness in our midst. This is a legendary. Both these, all three of these preachers will leave a preaching legacy that's unparalleled. Come on, put your hands together. So we'll reassemble here. We will reassemble here tomorrow at 5. The pastor's class will start at 5 sharp. The congregational class will start at 6.15. We will break for refreshment to reset for the second half. And then at 7 o'clock at 6.45, Sister Saxon, y'all give Sister Karen Saxon. The, she is the songbird of the Empire State. Thank you so much. To our president again, thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to share with us these last two days. I want to thank Reverend Sandra Baker, our conference coordinator, for her logistical and Herculean efforts that she put together. I couldn't do it without her. Amen. I want to thank Pastor Duckett who made sure our preacher got safely to the hotel last night to care of some of his first. Thank you, Dr. Duckett. Thank you. One of our youngest pastors, and he is God's preacher. Amen. All right. We're getting ready to go home. Let's pray for the conference. Dr. J.L. Carter, Bishop Carter, thank you, man. Raise your hand. Raise your hand. Y'all give him another hand. Thank you. He did not have to come all the way from Baltimore. This, I, I won't ever forget this, Carter. I won't ever forget this. Thank you so much. Let's look to God. God, we thank you for what our eyes have seen, ears have heard, hearts have felt. Dismiss us from this place tonight, but never from your presence. Go with us, guide us, keep us until we get safely to our destinations. And now may the grace of God, the love of Jesus Christ, sweet communion of the Holy Spirit, rest, rule, and abide with us all henceforth now and forevermore. Let the people of God say amen. God bless you and good night.